Good afternoon or good morning, good evening, good night, depending where you are um, on the globe. We have, uh, we have people from all over the world logging in today. And you're very welcome to this webinar hosted by FEMS UC Search and by uh, Oxford University Press, our publisher. My name is John Morrissey, um, based in University College Cork in Ireland, and I'm editor in chief of FEMS UC Search. And as you know, I'm going to be joined in the webinar today by Professor Daniela Donnery from the University of Manchester in the UK, and by Professor Tony Gabaldon from the Institute for Research in Biomedicine and the Supercomputing Centre in Barcelona in Spain. So you're all very welcome. Um, just by way of introduction and to give people time to be uh, joining the webinar, I'm just going to give a little bit of information about the, about the journal, in the journal and the context of these webinars. Let's see if I can advance my slides. The, the webinar is hosted by the Federation of European Microbiology Societies, which is very well known, of course, to all, um, all my colleagues in Europe, but might be less well known in other parts of the world. So FEMS is a federation of more than 50 uh, microbiology societies um, from all countries in Europe. And FEMS is really, uh, it's a community of microbiologists it's a scientific society, of course, not for profit. And uh, FEMS invests resources in science and in scientists and in people. And it's got a mission to try and help build the scientific uh, community of microbiologists and to help microbiologists have the maximum impact from our research. I just want to mention a couple of upcoming events before we get onto the webinar itself. Uh, FEMS holds a, a Congress every, every two years, but of course, this year we've had to change a lot of things because of um, COVID-19. And in fact, the FEMS Congress that was due to be held in Maastricht uh, in the summer has now been merged with the ASM Congress. And there will be a new Congress, the first ever World Microbe Forum, which is going to be held the 20th to 24th of June. And this is an online Congress and you can find out more on the FEMS website, worldmicrobeforum.org, or in, indeed on the um, ASM website as well. Now, FEMS UC Search, who, who are um, the hosts for today's webinar, and I'll say a bit about the journal in, in a moment, we're hosting a symposium uh, within the World Micro Microbe Forum, uh, Beyond the Frontier with Synthetic Yeast. Um, I'm chairing that session, and we've got some great speakers that you can see there. I think Saki is still holding out hope that there will be an Olympics um, this year. We all hope there'll be an Olympics. But in any case, he's going to talk about yeast Olympians. So that should be quite interesting. So that will be in the World Microbe Forum. I'll mention uh, the major yeast congress that's taking place uh, this year. It's a joint meeting between uh, ICY15 and uh, ICYGMB. And this is due to be held in Vienna in August. It will be held in Vienna in, in August. I guess there's still a chance, it's not clear yet whether it can really be physical or online. The plan is still for a physical meeting. But I just want to mention um, for people who are thinking of attending that meeting, that there is a call for papers for FEMS Yeast Research um, called the Spirit of Yeast. And you can see more about that on either the conference website or on, on the journal website. That kind of brings me to journals because uh, one of the major activities that FEMS carries out uh, to, to help uh, provide opportunities for scientists research and to generate income that we invest back into our research community is we publish uh, seven journals. Um, you can see them listed across there. The latest two journals are, are Microbes and MicroLife. These are fully open access journals the first five you see listed are hybrid journals. So you have a choice of free to publish or open access um, as you wish. And uh, of all of those journals, clearly the most important of these is FEMS Yeast Research. Um, now FEMS Yeast Research, uh, of, of which I'm editor-in-chief, um, Carl Monroe is deputy editor-in-chief. We, we publish uh, articles right across the spectrum of yeast biology. And we have a um, special series uh, of articles and issues. Um, I'll just draw your attention to um, 
the retrospective series that's edited by uh, Terry Cooper. Um, two articles I, I, I list here, My Route to Intimacy of Genomes, which is a retrospective by Bernard Dujon, is actually one of the most highly read articles ever in the journal, incredibly popular. And our most recent retrospective is one that will be of interest to a lot of people, and it's got a certain relevance today, to today's webinar because it's a retrospective um, of Carl Singer. Now, Carl Singer himself, uh, unfortunately, uh, passed away a few years back, but it was written by his son Harry and uh, Terry Cooper uh, based on interviews and writings and memories and, 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 and so forth. Certainly for those of us of a certain vintage, we have very good memories of micromanipulators and dissecting yeast tetrads and carrying out classical genetics in the era before genome sequences. And a lot of, uh, a lot of us will have worked with micromanipulators developed by uh, Carl Singer. And uh, that retrospective is a really interesting look back as well at some of the characters and some of the yeast conferences that took place um, in, in, especially I would say in, in, the, uh, in the last 20 or 30 years of what is now the last century. So I can recommend that article too. Uh, the journal also publishes regular thematic issues on uh, topical issues. Uh, we, we list three of them there, and the most recent of these is uh, the one on yeast genomes that, that was only published uh, in this, gen this January. We had one synthetic biology published in the latter part of last year and an anniversary issue last year, uh, both of which are available up on, on the website to see. The thematic issue on yeast genomes was edited by Jean-Marc Duran uh, from Technical University of Delft. Uh, many of you in the yeast community will know Jean-Marc very, very well. And he assembled an impressive list of authors to um, write these uh, review articles. You can see um, some of the authors listed on the right on the slide here. Um, and that thematic issue was launched in January. And as with all our thematic issues, all papers in that thematic issue are free to read for three months uh, from the launch, uh, regardless of whether they're on an open access license or not. You can see these articles by, by all these authors now. If, if you log on. And so you can see the top two names on the list are uh, Tony Gavaldon and Daniela Dulneri. And I'm very pleased to have Daniela and Tony um, with me today for this webinar. Uh, it's our second um, FEMS Yeast Research webinar. We had one on synthetic biology uh, before Christmas that, that was um, very well received. It's part of a whole series of webinars that FEMS organizes and you can view all the past webinars if you go to the FEMS YouTube channel. Um, this, the, a recording of this particular webinar will be up there as well um, in due course. So uh, Daniela Dalneri is um, native of Italy, but she's been uh, working in the United Kingdom for quite a few years now. And she's an expert on um, many aspects of, of Saccharomyces genomics, uh, genetics, uh, evolution, population biology, and biotechnology. Um, what you can see in front of you is a particular article that she published in that thematic issue. Um, and I know her talk today will draw on some of that article, but I know it's going to pick up on some other themes as well. And our second speaker that you can see is Tony Gibaldon. T Tony is, um, well, I'll, I'll describe Tony as a computational biologist. Um, he, he might disagree with me, I'm not sure, but Tony has done tremendous work on uh, yeast evolution and on reconstructing the, the evolution of um, Saccharomyces and other yeasts, and has given us some really interesting insights on how we, how we got to where we are with species um, and maybe on where we're going. And Tony's uh, review article in the um, Yeast Genomes TI was based on hybridization and the origin of new, new yeast lineages. And I'm sure that's going to be part of what he talks about today as well, and maybe some other things uh, in addition. So uh, at this point now, um, I'm hoping that somebody in the background, uh, Sarah has got control of my screen, and is go we're going to pass over to Daniela, uh, who, who's going to give the first presentation. And maybe just to let people know what, what's going to be happening, um, Daniela is going to give her presentation for 20 to 25 minutes. Uh, Tony will then give his presentation for a similar length of time. And then we'll have a discussion where I'll moderate the questions. 
Uh, on the right hand side of your screen, uh, you've got a panel and you'll see somewhere in there uh, the opportunity to ask questions. So if you have questions, uh, feel free to write them uh, at any stage uh, in that panel on the right. And when we get to the end of the two presentations, um, I'll take a look at the questions then and I'll, um, I'll, I'll pull out ones that maybe, well, I'll, I'll ask questions to, to the relevant speakers uh, based on, on what you submit. So please, uh, as questions occur to you, uh, throw them down. Um, the chat function is closed as far as I know, so it's not possible to chat to each other. And so uh, the speakers aren't going to be answering questions in real time or anything like that. In fact, the speakers don't see the questions. I'm the only person who sees the questions. Um, I see that there's about 240 people in attendance, which, which, which is great. Um, so in case I forget at the end, I'll just say thank you all for, for taking the time uh, to, to attend the webinar. I'm sure it's going to live up to your expectations. And um, as I say, uh, without any further ado, Daniela, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, John, and uh, uh, board meeting uh, uh, members for inviting me to present uh, the, the FAMSIS webinar. Today, I am going to uh, uh, um, sort of uh, describe in a sort of light touch way uh, uh, the uh, taxonomy of Saccharomyces genus, and I will show you some experimental uh, data on protein protein interaction and transcriptomine hybrids and uh, discuss some uh, a strategy uh, 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 to um, exploit uh, the extant biodiversity uh, for bio biotechnological uses. So these slides summarize the uh, evolution of the taxonomic rearrangement in the Cervizia genome and uh, the Saccharomyces cervizia census strict group was determined in, in the 1970 and uh, uh, encompasses species uh, which are uh, which are related to uh, fermentation, industrial fermentation, and it was separated from the uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae sensulatu group, uh, which encompasses species uh, uh, more distantly related. So back then, the taxonomy um, was relying on 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 a few morphological traits and and uh, uh, and few physiological uh, aspects to call a species, uh, but with uh, the advent of uh, more molecular tools, uh, some of the limitation of the uh, original uh, taxonomic classification were overcome. In 1998, uh, from the 21 species uh, um, originally assigned to the Saccharomyces cerevisiae sensu stricto group, uh, which uh, we went down to 14. And, uh, uh, and in uh, 2003, several other uh, species were reclassified, uh, and uh, uh, mainly due to the work of uh, Kurtzman and Robnett, uh, they established that the sensu stricto group was a monophyletic group distinct from the sensu lato, and uh, most of these uh, uh, sensu lato species were now reclassified in new uh, genomes. So, for example, Saccharomyces castelli is now now Movia castelli, and uh, Saccharomyces exiguus or Orsavazzi are now uh, Kazakhstani. So, another things which happened in uh, around about uh, uh, early thousand was the discovery of uh, a couple of new species, Saccharomyces micati and Saccharomyces cordycevi. Um, they were discovered in in, in, in Japan. And then another species, Saccharomyces caducanus, uh, which was discovered in, 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 in South America. Now, yeast, uh, um, um, it does uh, uh, reproduce uh, both sexually and asexually. So given it has sexual reproduction, the, the scientists found very useful to use the biological species concept to discriminate between species. So all the species listed here in, 2000 and in the 2003 sort of uh, timeline uh, are species which are reproductively isolated from each other. Uh, the hybrids between these species are, are sterile. 
Um, however, later on, uh, when more genomic studies came out, uh, um, Leachy and Ed Lewis group found that uh, the Caricanus uh, sequence, genome sequence, was uh, very, very similar to those of paradoxes. Uh, there was really uh, uh, um, um, not many, many differences. So they, they decided that Saccharomyces caryocanus is actually indeed a, 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 a subpopulation of, of paradoxes, uh, South American paradoxes, uh, sometimes they call it. So what I'd like to point out here is that Caryocanus is reproductively isolated due to uh, translocations. Originally, there were found four translocations between Caryocanus and paradoxes. Um, my group has a, a, a sequence using uh, value the Caryocanus genome. We found actually the translocation are five, and there are eleven inversion as well in this genome. Um, so Caryocanus is still a different biological species because it's still reproductively isolated but it has pretty much the same sequence as paradoxes and the four on the basis of a sort of phylogenetic sequence con uh, species concept karyokanus is, is now uh, not considered a species anymore in this group in 2011 we also had the discovery of, uh, of arboricola uh, from china uh, and from the group of uh, uh, bay and uh, uh, the discovery of ibayanus from uh, diego lipkin and uh, Joe Sampaio from uh, uh, Patagonia, uh, Argentina. And the Ubayano, that was quite exciting. But finally, we found the, the other parent of the Liger yeast, Pastoriano, so which we knew one part of Servisian and, and the other one was still de debatable. And, and now we know that the other parent is, is, is Ubayano. And more recently, my group uh, discovered a, a new uh, species again, the Saccharomyces urei. And uh, we stumbled across the species in a very fortuitous uh, sort of way. And I can tell you quickly the, the story. I have been um, enrolled in, in, in coordinating a field course in biodiversity and ecology for undergrad students at the University of Manchester. So we took this bunch of students, about 30 of them, in southern France in a region called saint van about 1,000 meter altitude. Um, on the, la the last day of this two weeks residential course, uh, the students were pretty much free to do what they wanted. And most of them did dangerous things like canyoning. And, uh, you know, uh, and staff decided to do research. So myself with my research associate at the time, Samina Nazib, we went around the area and we discovered patches of of oak trees, uh, which were quite high up because it was 1,000 meters above sea level. And we um, got some samples. And when Samina came back from the uh, trip, uh, he, she managed to isolate 200 colony. At that point, we, we didn't really know what much to do with these colonies. So we sent them to Ian Robertson and Steve Jones uh, in uh, at the, what it was, the Institute of Food Research. And they, we asked him, could you please have a look at the ITS and check them out if there's anything interesting. So we only sent three samples out of the 200 collected. And sure enough, uh, Steve came back and he said, well, actually something is really odd with one of them. It, it kind of may be novel. However, unless you got two samples, you know, we can't really um, describe a new species because you need two independent samples or, or strain. So Samina sent them another five frames, and, uh, and that was from another bar, an, an, another oak, one from soil, one from bark. And again, it came up the, that's an isolate, which it could be novel. And, um, and that's when we got really excited. And so all he asked me, I just go and send the entire 192 samples that we got, see what we get. And, you know, with, with our dismay, everything else came out as Saccharomyces paradoxes. So there was nothing else there. And so we were extremely lucky that within the first day sample we picked, we found these two isolates. So first of all, Samina looked whether Saccharomyces uri is a new biological species which it is because the uh, uh, spore variability is almost zero when we cross with Servisia, Micari, or three different population of paradoxes. So the highest spore variability we, we saw was 3.1%. 
And at that point, uh, I, I used to get teased quite a lot. I mean, Gianni Litti would come to me and say, oh, I mean, it's going to be another Cario Cano story. In reality, you know, you probably just discovered the uh, European para uh, Cari. But, I mean, thankfully that was not the case, it's because uh, when we did some sequencing, luminous sequencing, we did the phylogeny based on uh, 101, uh, Concarinated genes, evolutionary concern, that we saw that the Saccharomyces urey does indeed um, uh, uh, form a monophyletic group close to Megari. We also did some FAC biosequencing uh, to look at structural variation between the two strains, and we saw that there is uh, um, collinearity between the two isolates of urey. Um, when we uh, looked at them uh, compared to Servise, we saw that there were one and, and, and two translocations uh, between uh, these two species. Um, interestingly, one translocation uh, of Uri was in common with uh, both strains of Mikari. Um, and this uh, uh, second plot shows the, uh, um, the Mikari uh, chromosome versus the Uri, and the red is uh, a new translocation present in the Uri, and the black is the other translocation that Mikapi 1815 has. So um, the fact that Saccharomyces Uri did share one translocation with both Mikari isolates 15 and 16, it does point out to some sort of shared evolutionary history between these this, this, this species. So we also looked at the biochemical and phenotypic uh, characteristics of Uri, and uh, we, we saw that it can utilize maltose, but more importantly, it can also utilize many tires to, to a good level. Um, as far as concern, growth at different temperature, the isolates were growing pretty well at, at 16, colder temperature. I'm somewhere in the middle here at 30, uh, compared to Servizia, which is the green, uh, the green uh, line. But at 37, they were not able to grow at all, um, and only Servizia had a, a very good growth. So it's, it's conclusion, we show that Saccharomyces uri is a new species brought both from the biological and phylogenetic uh, 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 sort of point of view. Uh, we show uh, that both strains have two reciprocal translocation compared to Servizia, and one is in common with, with Mikari, 18 and 16. Um, both strains of these new species show the same mitochondria profiling, and actually COX-2 and COX-3 uh, restriction fra fragment polypomorphism analysis shows that they are similar to the sort of paradoxes mitochondria. And they can ferment many the tires, they're more cryopolarant than cerevisia, and they do not grow at 37. And most of the community probably already know that the Ure, uh, Saccharomyces Uri name was, was chosen in, 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 in memory of Professor Ure Pisker and his uh, um, outstanding contribution to his genetics and, and, and molecular biology. So going back to the taxonomic rearrangement, um, I just want to point out another uh, um, story, which I call it the, the Bayanus saga. So, so Bayanus went through a, a different um, rearrangement again. Um, in 2011, there were two sort of variants of this Bayanus, one called Yuvarum and one called Bayanus with the Yuvarum being more homogeneous uh, genome-wise than, than, than the other. It was only thanks to the discovery of Yubayanus that this taxonomy uh, was resolved as well. And, and it turns out that the Saccharomyces uh, Bayanus variant of Yuvarum is actually a true species, and, 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 and it's now uh, called Saccharomyces Yuvarum while the Bayanus variant of Bayanus is, is a real hybrid, and we each contain about two-thirds of the genome of Uvarum, one-third of the genome of Bayanus, and a little bit of introgression from Silesia. So now, of course, in this uh, a picture, I'll just show you a couple of hybrids, uh, 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 main, the main hybrids known for the uh, sensu stricto group, but the reality is that we've got tons of different hybrids between all of these uh, uh, species, uh, both at an interspecies level and an intraspecies level. And they are all sort of being isolated from, uh, um, from different substrate. So why do these species hybridize so, um, so readily? 
Well, idealization, you know, is a sweet mechanism to reshuffle your genome, introduce novel allelic variant. It can combine advantageous traits from both parents, um, and uh, and and that is uh, fair enough. We all know that, but. I mean, also what we uh, we um, looked in my lab is, is that hybrids has actually two diverged proteins, and the diverged protein itself could be a source of variation, a source where the evolution could actually uh, act upon uh, to lead to new adaptation. And if you think, you know, in hybrids, two genomes and therefore two proteins coexist with this little sort of a cartoon representing different proteins. Also, what we know is that the majority of the function in a cell are carried out by protein complexes. And the correct assembly of a protein complex and the correct interaction is, is key for uh, carrying, to carry out a, a proper biological function. So you can imagine when you hybridize two different species, you will have uh, assembly of protein complexes in the hybrid. So one question is, was what's happening to this assembly in the hybrid? Will it just majorly be uh, uh, unispecific? So these uh, different protein members co-evolved, they co-evolved in their parent uh, genome, and therefore they might uh, be able to um, preferentially stick uh, with each other. So having two sort of unispecific protein complex is present in the hybrid. Or oh, the other possibility though is um, can autologous, different autologous member uh, uh, um, uh, uh, create chimeric protein complexes. And if you can create chimeric protein complexes, you immediately can see that there could be a, a substrate for variation. Um, and also the ability or not to form a function of chimeric protein complexes will sort of have an effect on uh, evolutionary trajectory in terms of uh, gene retention and gene loss in the uh, hybrid genome. So the study uh, uh, that we carried out, we, we, we studied six different protein complexes with uh, uh, immunoprecipitation and uh, mass spectrometry, and we show that actually protein, chimeric protein can form naturally in the hybrid, at least in four cases out of six that we looked. The next question was, what effect such primary complex may have on a phenotype of the hybrid? So you can imagine all these different combinations uh, could lead to a uh, same fitness, a loss or an increase of this fitness. And also, you could imagine that this could be environmental dependent. So one of the complex that we uh, studied, the TRIP233, we, uh, uh, we, we look at what happened when we force the cell to use uh, different complexes. So, for example, we, we deleted uh, uh, this, this, this the trip 2 from Cerviz and the trip 3 from uh, Uvarum in this lab hybrid, and we created two different chimeric combinations and we created some unispecific combination. And then what we look is at what happens to this hybrid in absence of tryptophan uh, in, in terms of growth. And as you can see here, all the hybrid had a very different phenotypic sort of uh, uh, display of growth. And uh, interestingly, the one which was growing sort of better than the other was the one which was harboring the uh, chimeric combination. So this is done in monoculture, but we also did one-to-one uh, um, -one competition using facts. And again, the uh, uh, the hybrid which was outcompeted the other was the one which was having the chimeric uh, complex. So. So this data points out that we have a phenotypic variation of different protein assembly, and this could be important to adapt uh, to, to adaptation and to uh, uh, um, genome evolution in, in, in itself going forward. The other variation that you have in the hybrid is given from the mitochondria. So mitochondrial DNA uh, uh, is usually uh, inherited B, uh, from both parents when you create a hybrid. However, within very uh, few generations, the hybrid will kick out one or the other mitochondria. So in recent years, several studies have been, uh, been carried out to try to understand uh, uh, how, how, why and how uh, the hybrid decides which mitochondria to keep. Um, is this some sort of an environmental, uh, 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 there are environmental cues that they are, uh, um, that they help the hybrid to make this decision. And, and 
is there any impact on the fitness of the hydro when they host different mitochondria? And we now know from different groups, from different studies, um, that there are uh, an impact on fitness uh, uh, on different nutrition and also different temperature. So my group specifically was interested to understand how the retention of the different mitochondria can actually affect the expression of the nuclear genome in itself. And um, what we did, we, we created some lab hybrids between Cervisium and Uvarum, uh, one harboring the Cervisium, one harboring the Uvarum mitochondria. And we did uh, some rna beta, both in fermentative and non-fermentative condition and at two different temperatures, one well, higher and one more, more uh, lower. So uh, interactingly, we, we saw uh, difference to nuclear expression due to the different mitotype. These are circular plot, and they can uh, you can see, for example, in in, in these uh, we look at uh, we compare the hybrid which has the Cervise mitochondria with a hybrid which has got the Uvaro mitochondria. And for the Cervise allele, you can see that why there is no difference at all in any condition in the uh, mitochondria with the Cervise uh, with the hybrid with Cervise mitochondria. We see a bunch of genes here upregulated when uh, in the condition, uh, non fermented condition at uh, warmer temperature. Um, you know, you can then look in mind these genes, and they were mainly uh, involved in the respiratory chain and mitochondrial translation. So there, uh, um, and there are other examples like that, both from the Cervisia and the Uvarus genome. So we also then decided to look at the co-expression profile throughout this, this condition, and uh, it was interesting to see that uh, um, there were a really specific cluster which were mapping a different cellular, uh, biochemical cellular pathway. For example, in the respiratory chain complex, the majority of the allele which had a shared co-expression profile were, were uh, from Cervisia, while the um, uh, um, the, in, in the lipidic biosynthesis, for example, the majority of allele which did have a concerted expression were, were the UVAL. So the, again, this, this data uh, um, you know, brings about the notion that the cell uh, prefer uh, to use either uh, one parental set or the other parental set of the alleles uh, um, according to the different uh, uh, biochemical pathway used. So in conclusion, you know, we, we show that chimeric product interaction are uh, a possible new source of natural variation. They gener generate novel phenotypes. Different mitochondria are also, those also, do also have an impact on fitness and nuclear gene expression. And uh, so the next question would be how can we can use all these natural phenotypic variation to improve uh, perhaps biotechnological traits in hybrid. We know that hybrids are vastly used in, in fermentation uh, and brewery, for example. Um, so, um, I mean, myself and Ed Lewis uh, uh, set up with a collaboration with uh, Catherine Smart and uh, back then uh, what used to be Sam Miller and now is, is A.B. Imbev. Uh, we set up to uh, see whether we can actually uh, uh, exploit, you know, breeding uh, um, over selection uh, to improve uh, 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 traits, uh, uh, strain improvement for, for specific traits of industrial importance. So the problem which uh, we encounter when we deal with the hybrids, they're actually sterile. And if they're sterile, they're not genetically tractable. As I, most of you probably already know, uh, the hybrids uh, are uh, um, through meiosis, in, in, through, when it goes through meiosis, produce mainly majority dead spars because there is sequence divergence which brings lack to the combination in the two set of uh, homologous chromosome. However, if uh, instead of starting with a hybrid, which is a diploid, we start with a hybrid, which is a tetraploid, for which we have two set of chromosomes of one species and two set of chromosomes of a different species, then this hybrid can happily go through meiosis and it can produce healthy diploid hybrid spores, which contains one set of chromosomes from one species and one set of chromosomes from the other species. Um, this process has already been uh, uh, shown by Duncan Gregg and Ed Lewis back in 2002 that tetraploidization 
is actually breaking speciation barrier and you can actually have a, a um, viable spot. So what we plan to do then was to incorporate as much possible biodiversity in tetraploid hybrid uh, uh, and then look at their deeper progeny for scrambled traits. So uh, Daniela, just a quick interruption. Are you keeping an eye on the time there? We just have a couple of minutes. Okay, right. So I'm going to go very quickly here. Um, so we have two uh, interspecies uh, uh, deployed that we can create in the lab, uh, species A and species B. What we can do, we can delete the mating type locals uh, 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 on uh, one uh, and the other, and they will they will um, feel that they are actually deployed mater. And if they feel that they are mater, they will actually create a fertile hybrid. So this fertile hybrid can go through meiosis and the spores, which will be deployed, and uh, some of them will be mat A and mat alpha, will have a, a, a sort of a um, scramble trait between all these uh, uh, species. And again, these, uh, if you do random uh, mating and through meiosis, you can come to, for example, uh, an F12 generation, which have a lot of scrambled trait. And at this point, you can see you can actually have a big phenotypic screening to understand uh, what, uh, which one of these uh, do better than the other in specific condition. So my lab did uh, Cerevisia Kudretseri and Yuri, Cerevisia Yuri hybrid at the labs uh, uh, focused on Yubayanos and Yubarum hybrid. We also introduced different mitochondria on each hybrid, either Cerevisia or Kudretsevi, um, Yuri or, or Cerevisia. And so we had two different levels of variation. Uh, we had actually three variation of different strains, variation of different species, and variation of different mitochondria. Now, um, that is just to show you a yeah, different sort of um, a different uh, con uh, condition. How big is the phenotypic space of this progeny? And what you can do now, you can take the 20 best performer and the 20 bottom performance, and you can do sort of QTL type of studies, which we did um, using a multiple approach. So we, we studied in my lab low temperature growth on maltose and acidic acid. So now I got a couple of slides with uh, um, results of these, um, which I'm going to go sort of as quick as possible. First things we looked is that the mitochondria have a profound effect on the QTL landscape. There were very little QTL share between different mitotypes, only this, this, this yellow show a sharing between the two. Um, uh, a mitotype, and that was pretty much happening in all conditions and for all hybrids that we looked. Um, also, we uh, were able to overlap QTL regions uh, um, and, uh, uh, from different hybrids, and that allows identification of a lot of co causal genes. And uh, you can see, for example, these one of low temperature. We got all uh, a hybrid, uh, at least one mitotype, which overlap with this co. Q6 uh, gene, which is um, uh, a monooxidase, uh, mitochondrial monooxidase involving the respiration and, and, and fatty acid. And uh, so far and so on, I don't have time now, but similar uh, story for maltose and acidic acid, we had uh, pretty much uh, identified a specific QDL. Um, QDL were uh, validated by the classic recycling of endosis, and all the alleles showed a significant difference in growth in a tetraploid background. But the key thing is that we now wanted to see whether these were specific to the hybrid or they were actually QTL, which would come up also in a normal diploid uh, Cervisia species. And uh, when we look at the same uh, uh, sort of QTL in the parent species, looking this time in diploid Cervisia strain, this QTL uh, significantly disappeared, apart from this one, which actually showed an inverse trend. So in this case, the uh, one allele uh, uh, which was uh, defective or less good in, in the tetraploid is actually better in the, in, in the parent. So that still, uh, you know, support the notion that there are some, a uh, lot of these QTL are actually hybrid specific. So these are some conclusion. Um, and the important thing is to, to look at the 
full uh, 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 the um, idea of using these uh, uh, um, breeding genetics and material genetics uh, applied to, to hybrids and these algae lines. We managed to, to look at the QTL, uh, which are independent and dependent mitochondrial origin. We identify QTL hybrid specific, and that we have a show a possibility of, of developing uh, hybrids for uh, for um, you know biotechnological purposes. So the this is the last slide. This is another example of a. Uh, uh, a nice biotechnological project that we have in our lab. Uh, we exploited Saccharomyces urei uh, uh, and the different sort of flavor profile that this strain had uh, to hybridize it with uh, an age strain to produce some craft there. So we didn't do it alone. Uh, Cloud Water Brew was, was on board with this project. Uh, and um, uh, we, we created different neurons with a uh, hybrid. And uh, um, these are the different sort of uh, um, flavor profile that we found for, for the parents and the hybrids. So the, the urine had lower production of esters, but a little bit more of spice and clove and more phenolic uh, taste. Also, the problem in urine doesn't ferment very well. So the hybridization with the L strains created a, a strain which had efficient fermentation, had a much better sugar attenuation and a different a spectrum of flavor. Um, and now cloud water is 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 uh, making up more of these uh, awesome hybrid beers for us after uh, hopefully the lockdown. This is the announcement slide. Uh, I got to sense a lot of people, but in particular Samina Nazib, who is being um, uh, instrumental in the uh, discovery of Saccharomyces urea, in the characterization of urea genome, and also in the curial study. Samina now has moved on from my lab, he's got her own position in the University of Staffordshire as a senior lecturer. Um, Protein work is done by Elizabeth. Uh, Haya uh, wrote the review with me and she uh, is an expert on uh, yeast biodiversity. Um, Sarah worked on the mitochondria, Constantina works on the beer, and Federico worked on the QDL and on the beer with Constantina. Thank you so much. And these, of course, are my collaborator. Without them, nothing would ever be done. Thank you so much for listening. I'm sorry if I'm a couple of minutes late. That, that, that's all right, Daniela. Thank you very much. That, that, was, um, that was really interesting. And I can see questions um, coming in um, on my screen there that, uh, that I'll be holding to, to ask you later. If, uh, if, if more people have questions for Daniela, you, know, you can be writing them now if you want in the questions panel there on your right. Thank you. Um, Enjoy that, and I, I think um, I think the hybridization or the discussion of hybrids is going to lead very nicely into um, Professor Tony Gabaldon's talk. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, Tony is based at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center and Institute for Research in Biomedicine in in Barcelona. Um, and uh, I won't use up any of your time now with any further introductions, Tony. Um, the floor is yours, and look forward to your presentation. Thank you. So thank you, John. I just want to confirm that you see my slides and you hear me. Yes, uh, yes, Tony, we do. Okay, okay great. So as John said, I'm going to talk about uh, hybridization and the origin of images. And if, uh, if someone is more interested, you, you can read the, the review that was mentioned uh, before on this special issue of FEMS uh, research. So I'll start with this picture, which I took in the old times when we were allowed to travel. To the countries. This picture I took in the in the airport of uh, uh, in Sweden in Estocolm, and it depicts Carl von Linné, who is very well known as the father of taxonomy. He's also well known for coining the famous sentence uh, "Natura non facit saltum," which means that nature does not progress in jumps. He was of the idea that you can find gradients uh, between different species, and so uh, nature. You know, there was a natural gradient between uh, most differences you can find in nature. This idea was embraced very heavily by Charles Darwin in his theory for the origin of species. And in his mind, also, uh, species were evolving step by step in small steps and selection, uh, you know, selecting those small changes that were a bit more favorable, favorable than others. However, already in those times, the, the good friends of Charles Darwin were 
you know, telling him that maybe he was a bit, uh, you know, taking a risk embracing that idea so heavily because, you know, nature, at least in the idea, in the eyes of Huxley, nature was indeed making small jumps. So in modern genetics, also this idea of, you know, step by step uh, evolution was was taken forward, and most of the models. They envision population uh, populations evolving by you know, accumulating mutations and, and then selection and treat, uh, you know, making these uh, populations moving slowly uh, through the genotype space, or at least not slowly, but at least in small steps uh, through the genotype space. And then, uh, regarding on the fitness, you know, uh, choosing which direction they go in this genotype space. However, we now know that there are actually jumps in, in evolution, uh, which are sometimes called quantum leaps, in which you know uh, species can jump in this genotype space. By meaning uh, of these jumps, they don't accumulate just uh, tiny mutations, small mutations, but they, these can be you know, huge uh, radical changes. And here are some examples like gene or genome duplications, uh, processes of symbiosis would be considered as this uh, hybridization is one of them and lateral gene transfer. All these are examples in which, you know, the jumps in the genotype space can be radically long and therefore also the changes in fitness can be also um, very large as a result. So today I'm gonna to talk about hybridization and hybridization is, is, a, is a concept that was explored uh, much uh, earlier than, than the advent of genomics and it's, it's a concept that is usually explored in the, in the framework of the, of the concept of the species. We all know the example of the horse and the donkey uh, that they can breed and have a mule which is sterile and this is proves you know, biological species concept that horses and donkeys are you know, different species. However, I want to, to emphasize that uh, hybrids can also be considered you know, uh, by mating within the same species. If the populations are you know, divergent of species, can also be considered uh, hybrids. And just to refer to the famous book of uh, Gregor Mendel, in he, in which he was referring as hybrids uh, to the process of you know, different varieties of so this is another cartoon showing, you know, the idea, you know, a genetics uh, insight into hybridization. We can we can envision a species as a, you know, a set of different populations that are interconnected. They can exchange uh, genes and, and genetic material, and therefore there's a kind of gradient in the genetic diversity within within the species. So there's a continuous space of genetic diversity joining all these different populations that are somehow connected consider the concept of species like that. But those populations can get, you know, isolated from one another by whatever barrier you can imagine. And these populations may evolve differently for some time as depicted here, but after some time, these barriers can be removed know, by other you know, islands that, that separate, but then there is, a, there is a land joining them or something, you can imagine whatever scenario. And then the two populations can start uh, you know, exchanging uh, genes or genetic material if they are still compatible. And this is what is called, you know, hybrid zone usually is the area where they mix and the hybrids are the, the offspring between mating of these two different populations. So what happens afterwards? So it can be, you know, different things can happen. Imagine one of these hybrids cannot back cross with one of the parentals, but they, they can with another parent. You can imagine the, the hybrid between the red and the yellow as being an orange you know, has a mixture of the, of the genetic characteristics of the two species and if, if it can't back cross to one of the species after some time uh, what this will lead to is to genetic integration you will have a mostly red organism with mostly red genome with pieces maybe of the yellow genome retained and particularly they will be retained if they confer a selective advantage that, that given each. And we have heard of many examples of this uh, happening with Saccharomyces. So, but what can also happen is that the hybrid cannot back cross with either of the parents, and therefore this hybrid is doomed uh, to, to get extinct if, uh, if it must undergo you know, sexual reproduction, such as uh, in the case of the mule. But if it's in an organism that can have a sexual reproduction, then it can survive as long as it fits 
uh, the environment. So it's a particular, uh, couple of particular considerations for hybrids in fungi. I mean, uh, because historically hybrids have been studied in animals and plants, not so much in fungi. And this is because they are very difficult to detect. Now, first of all, the species concept in microbes, you know that is perfectly clear and everybody agrees. Uh, so therefore it's also so difficult to, to study hybrids because it's a difficult concept for microbes. And also hybrids are difficult to recognize because you know, they basically share the same morphology as the parents and if they may have, of course, uh, physiological differences, but it's true also that within a species, within different strains of the same species, you can have huge physiological differences as well. So it's very difficult sometimes to recognize only from the outside characters. But it's nevertheless suspected because, you know, in microbes, uh, we find less presybiotic barriers as compared to cellular animals and plants. And also they have the ability to reproduce clonally. So they were sort of expected. And they were, uh, you know, uh, started to be discovered as, as it was expected with the advent of, of genomics. So in recent years, with uh, more and more uh, genomes coming out, we have been discovering a higher number of hybrids. And Danielle already mentioned the huge number of hybrids that we find within the Saccharomyces species com uh, complex. And just to mention that many of these hybrids, they thrive in you know, uh, fermentative uh, environments and industrial or human-made environments. Also, some, uh, some work from, uh, from my group in the past, we, we show evidence that actually the whole so-called post-whole genome duplication clade was actually derived from an ancient hybridization between two different lineages that hybridize. And because of this uh, you know, asexuality and these incompatibilities between the genomes, a tetraproidization favored uh, recovery of, of the ability to reproduce sexually. This is what we think it happens in the origin of the, of the whole genome. So nowadays, this is a cartoon from the review, and it's, uh, it's showing, you know, where hybrids have been found within the Saccharomycotina. And this is, of course, not complete. Uh, we have a lot of you know, hybrids within Saccharomyces, but also in, in Psychosaccharomyces, and the, in the different clades, a lot of hybrids within the Candida clade, in Pikia clade, uh, and so forth. And this picture is already out of date. And I'm trying to kind of keep track of new hybrid species or, or uh, you know, species with hybrids that are described. Uh, and one way I'm doing it is by asking in Twitter. And, and I was really pointed out to, to many uh, new examples that were, uh, ar that arose during the last, last year. So I want to remark that, that we have in this list hybrid species, which means I call hybrid species you know, species for which all the identified members are hybrids, and sometimes even the, the type of specimen that was used to describe the species is hybrid. But also we have species with hybrids, you know, species in which we have homozygous uh, parental species that can form a hybrids. And we find, you know, a fraction of the strains from that species are actually hybrids. Most of these hybrids have been identified uh, from industrial or clinical environments. But this is likely reflecting a sampling bias. These are the environments that we are more interested in, but uh, I bet they likely have a similar important role in natural environments. In my group, we are very much interested in, in the role of hybrids in virulence and in pathogenesis because we want to understand, we are studying fungal pathogens. And there we realize that within a single clade, uh, you have a bunch of uh, highly related species uh, that can be, you know, uh, be, can be commensals of humans or can be exposed to humans, but only from those set of species, only a few of them are able to uh, colonize or infect humans. And we want to understand what are the genomic determinants of this ability to infect uh, humans pathogens. And in several cases, we have found that uh, hybrids are enriched within clinical isolation. This is an example of the Candida parapsilosis clades, clade that was you know, divided into three different species, parapsilosis, orthopsilosis, and metapsilosis, some years ago. And we have found that both uh, Candida metapsilosis and Candida orthopsilosis are mostly hybrids. In the case of Candida metapsilosis, all uh, clinical isolates will have uh, 
investigated so far are hybrids, and we never found uh, the homozygous parentals among clinical isolates. And the case of orthopsilosis, this is similar, but we do find only one of the parentals among clinical isolates, but it's, there is a bias towards only one of the parentals, and these, they constitute uh, a minimal part of the clinical isolates. So the majority of the clinical isolates are actually hybrids. These hybrids are um, you know, present everywhere around the globe, and, and we think there is some connection between the fact that they are hybrids and the fact that they are able uh, to colonize better humans and cause disease as compared to their homozygous parents. So we, we have proposed that hybridization may be a route in the emergence of new uh, clinical or pathogenic species. So uh, since we proposed that, we have been finding more uh, and more uh, hybrids among candida pathogens. Most of these rare candida pathogens that are not so common in the clinics, but are sometimes are very recalcitrant and very resistant to antifungal drugs. And when we have done and sequenced those genomes, we have found that they have been uh, they originated through hybridization. This is the case, for instance, of candida inconspicuous. And also in the case of candida albicans, we can detect in the genome uh, signatures that can uh, be explained by an ancient hybridization in the common ancestor of all candida albicans strains. So also candida albicans is being derived from an ancient um, hybridization. And we don't know whether this was related to colonization with humans or not, but it's, it's very intriguing. So conclusions from this first part is that you know, uh, Saccharomycotina, Saccharomycotina hybrids can be found uh, everywhere. Of course, if you look for them, if you will look uh, in some environments, you don't find them, but I, I, I think they will find uh, every, um, you know, everywhere in many different environments. Uh, hybrids can be formed recursively, so for some of the species, as I will talk about, like uh, candida orthopsilosis, the same hybrid has been formed uh, convergently several times between the same two parental species. So if we think uh, as has a lot of uh, important implications in terms of species concepts. So hybrids can form a new lineage, and we consider this hybrid as a new species because it evolves independently from the others. We could say that that species can be can be appearing again and again through evolution as long as the two parental lineages are there and can hybridize and form a new hybrid lineage. So, as I said, some defined species are hybrid species, so the type of specimen are, is hybrid and all the members that have been analyzed are hybrids. And they, we also have hybrids between uh, non-hybrid species. So they, they are shown to, to successfully colonize new niches. And as Daniela explained, this is a property, a typical property of, of hybrids that they sometimes show transgressive phenotypes that are different from those existing in the parentals or interesting combinations of phenotypes present in the parental, in the parental lineages. And that, that's why they are you know, sometimes colonizing new niches such as those created by, by human. Also, we can see um, us uh, humans as a new interesting niche for this species. And finally, probably human-related activities such as globalization, trade, environmental alteration, climate change, industry, drugs, all these things probably is promoting the formation of novel hybrids by, you know, uh, moving species uh, around in the world and changing the environment and putting and under stress and creating new niches, new niches for hybrids to survive. So in the second part of my talk, uh, if I have time, I will talk about you know, how, what we are doing in our lab to, to study how these hybrids work. We are very interested in, in how they evolve, once they are formed, how they evolve, and of course, how, how they can survive in the first place. Because most theory says that uh, these hybrids should have a lot of negative epistatic interactions because you are putting together uh, two genomes that have been evolved uh, separately for a long time and accumulated mutations and been optimizing these complexes and all these things uh, for some time. And then you uh, mix up uh, the two things together. So how can they survive or, or what are the constraints they have to evolve further? And in the review, I talk about a concept that I think is important and I defined uh, for the first time in that review, uh, which I call hybrid genetics. And this is opposed to hybrid zones, which you may have heard of, which is uh, referring to the areas in which two, uh, the, the geographical distribution of two species 
overlap and therefore hybrids between these two closely related species can be formed. So this is a geographical, let's say, a hybrid zone. But I'm referring to the, the hybrid genetic zones, which is you know maps in different um, in different axes or in different uh, dimensions. So one dimension is the genetic divergence. We can define the hybrids according to the genetic divergence between the genomes that, that form the hybrid, like the two species that form the hybrid or the two lineages that form the hybrid, and also the degree of gene flow between these two populations that form the hybrid. So whether these two uh, genomes are exchanging material very often or very rarely. And according to these parameters, you can define uh, different hybrid zones. You will define a species zone, the typical species zone, with populations that are highly related to each other and with a lot of genetic exchange and you can find different hybrids in different zones and um, depending on, on what's the genetic divergence and what's the likelihood that these species exchange material uh, and so on and according to this you can have different expectations regarding you know, how frequently you're expected to find these hybrids how viable you expect them to be you know, how much uh, sick or healthy you expect uh, a typical hybrid to be uh, this is related to, to how many incompatibilities you may have in, in their genomes and also the transgressiveness is you know, how different is the phenotype uh, expected to be with respect to that of the, of the parental genome. So it's just a theoretical framework to interpret the different types of hybrids uh, we have studied. So I will talk about two different stories very briefly um, not to make uh, my talk very long. And one relates to hybrids which are clearly in this, in this zone, which is between species that are you know, highly divergent uh, genetically and also uh, that they do not exchange much genetic material. And in that, in that area, because there is a lot of genetic divergence, the theory predicts that they have a lot of uh, negative static interactions. And also you can think of it's not just the proteins that interact, but also the, regula the regulation of the genomes genome is regulated with you know, transcription factors and all these other factors that ensure that the gene is expressed in the right moment at the right level. And then you, you put these two uh, systems together uh, and, and mix them out. So the, our question here was to, to understand whether these hybrids were suffering uh, from what is called a transcriptional shock in the hybrids. This is the idea put forward by Barbara McClinton uh, for plants in which you know when you create uh, hybrids because of interactions between the regulatory systems uh, hybrids may experience the shock in which genes are dysregulated uh, with respect to the homozygous parentals. So what we did was uh, to set up uh, this experiment in which we took you know, the Saccharomyces, freshly made Saccharomyces cerevisiae, Saccharomyces ubarum uh, hybrid which is highly divergent species as Daniela explained already and then uh, we put them you know we grow them in the, independently in normal temperature and also low temperatures and, and we wanted to compare you know expression of the genes you know uh, when they are in the in the pure species background genetic background and when they are put together in the hybrid in the hybrid context or in the pure uh, strain uh, context and also we could compare expression between orthologs and expression between homologs within the hybrid and also uh, because we had the different temperature we wanted to compare you know, how much the hybrid impact uh, gene expression as compared to another type of shock in this case you know, a thermal shock we wanted to know whether hybrids were inducing a higher shock uh, in transcription uh, as compared to thermal shock and this is uh, basically the results we got so the the, the top here in, on the top you have one minus correlation, which means the lower is the more similar is the patterns of expressions of genes uh, in, the, in the given comparison and the color code indicates the comparison. So as you can see, when we compared um, genes with uh, the, the pattern of expressions of genes in the, in the pure background to that in the hybrid, we saw they highly correlated. And the correlation was much higher. I mean, they were altering their expression much less than when you induce this thermal shock. So in this case, the hybrid shock was smaller, was smaller than the thermal shock. And, and also what another thing we could see is that when we compare the expression between orthologs, you have a given amount of divergence. 
But when you compare this expression of the same genes in the hybrid context, and they have much lower differences. So kind of hybridization, instead of increasing the differences between the expression of the genes of different species, it is somehow buffering differences in gene expression. So this is a high contrast with what has been observed in animal hybrids or plant hybrids, such as uh, you know, Drosophila or several crop species, in which uh, even for more highly related species, people have seen a lot of misregulation of, of, the, of, the, tra of the transcriptome. We still don't understand why, uh, why is that. We don't know what's the fundamental differences, maybe the absence of transposons, maybe uh, the different layers of regulations. We still don't understand that this shows that at least at the transcription level, hybridization is not a big issue for these hybrids, which may explain why they can be formed uh, in this very context. In, in another project in the group, we are investigating another type of hybrids, which I will classify here. So the divergence between the parentals is much lower, it's like three to five percent uh, sequence divergence between the two parental genomes, and there's no uh, genetic exchange between, between these species because they, well, actually the species are thought to be asexual and, and we don't see this expression. And these are uh, candida hybrids and we are investigating several of them in this, in this range. And one of them is candida orthopsilosis, which I mentioned to you that we have evidence from Geraldine Butler's group that it has formed several times independently by the crossing of the same two parental lineages. And we know that because sometimes you have the mitochondrion of one parent, sometimes the mitochondrion of the other parent, sometimes you have a recombined mitochondrion, and we can define at least four independent uh, hybrid clades. We, um, we and others have sequenced several of these clinical strains, and you can see that the different clades have uh, typically different patterns of loss of heterozygosity. And by investigating these patterns, we expect to learn uh, you know, how these uh, hybrids evolve and what are the constraints that determine this uh, evolution of loss of heterozygosity after a hybrid is formed. Because we think this gives us an opportunity like the same uh, you know, experiment has been repeated by evolution several times and we have access to natural hybrids of each species in different ways. And this work is ongoing, so I hope I will be able to talk about this in a future seminar. And with this, I will finish. Uh, I will, of course, thank uh, the people in my group who participated in this project. I talked mostly uh, Veronica Michao and, and Ran Hopanisan, who are two uh, PhD, PhD students. And, well, uh, both of them just finished their PhD very recently, and also collaborators, Stone Buchhout, Attila Gatsen, Nosek. And this picture is the last picture we took uh, when we were able to socially or <laughs> interact closely, and this picture will be a bit more up to date. And with this, I think I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Uh, Tony, thank you very much. Um, again, that was, that was a great presentation um, and raises many intriguing questions. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to look at these questions and do, do my best now to answer them, to ask them to you. Um, I'll direct them to who, the person they've been directed to, but maybe the other person might like to answer as well, because some of the questions that came to Daniela, I think, will also apply to Tony. Um, but Daniela, this was a question that came for you. And it is, which factors led to hybrid strains being protagonists in some industrial processes like beer and non-hybrid strains prevailing in others. Um, and it says wine, baking, and fuel ethanol. Do, do, do you want to, and I, I think I'll come to Tony after you answer, because I think Tony might like to comment on that as well. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure I understand, is which hybrid are more relevant for uh, uh, brewery processes? No. So no, no. So I think the question is, in some, um, let's say, some industrial processes, hybrids are very common, like brewing, whereas mm -hmm. in other industrial processes, mm -hmm. it's a, the question is the hybrids are rare. And, and why is that? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, in, uh, uh, in beer, we, we find both bold because we've got hybrids from the lager and, and uh, the ale strains are usually cerveza, so they're not hybrid. In wine, we have uh, cerveza, but we also have hybrid Kudlatsevian cerveza. 
Um, so, you know, at least this is for these two sort of two, two processes. Um, uh, I guess that in uh, uh, it all comes down to uh, whatever environmental situation the, 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 the yeast is, is, is finding itself in. You know, we know that for the fermentation, the hybridization brings together the um, ability of ferment at low temperature, uh, which comes from the so Ubayanus parent, and uh, the ability to ferment, which has come from the Cerise parent, and uh, that uh, is ideal for the fermentation in, 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 in the lager. And to some degree, we see that in the Uri uh, uh, and uh, the Saccharomyces Cerise ale strain hybrid, in which we were able to improve fermentation, uh, 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 but uh, adding the cryo, a bit of cryo tolerance from urine and a bit of uh, different aroma profile. Oh, oh, okay, thanks. Uh, Tony, do you want to comment on, on that as well? And may, maybe a related thing you could, could answer because it's come up is the, the extent, I know you addressed it a little bit, but the extent to which um, human activity either kind of creates hybrids, if I phrase it like that, or, or selects for them. Okay, so so I first regarding the first question, I, I agree with what Daniela said, and I also want to know that many of these non-hybrid species uh, or, or strains that are present in these, in these beers or wine, they do have uh, regions of introgression. So I think they are, in a way, they are they are highly evolved. They were hybrids in the past, and they, in the end, they retain. So I think the process of hybridization actually favored colonization of, of, this, of this. But I would say the same also. It's, it's a question of contingency and opportunity. You have a niche. Whatever species that can thrive and outcompete the others will be there. Not necessarily a hybrid. Hybrids simply because they shackle genes and properties. They may create, uh, you know, things that are suited for uh, new environments for which a species had not been adapted uh, for a long time. And regarding the other question, yeah, it's difficult to quantify. Um, yeah, I would like, you know, one idea I have is to go back in collections, but yeah, collections are not that old because human activity, you know, started. Uh, you know, trading and so on a long time ago, but it would be good to know this, but actually it's, it's by common sense that, you know, if you are disturbing the environment, I mean, we know this is happening, you know, the, you know polar bears and the grizzlies, you know, because of climate change and, and impact, they are now encountering each other, hybridizing, so we see this in, in, in other species, and, and for sure in microbes it's happening even more because of the ability to disperse and to be, you know, associated with crops and, and with products and, and, and with animals. Okay, thanks, Tony. And uh, there's a question here that I suspect that there mightn't be an answer to, but uh, it's to do, I guess, with a species concept. And the question is, what percentage of variability between species suggests a novel species? Um, it says in genomic and phenotypic level. Yeah, okay. So, uh, to be honest, I don't remember on the top of my, my mind, but I think a few percentage, uh, you know, I mean, is probably already enough to establish a new a, a new species. Uh, um, the um, the um, the problem of biological species concept versus what was called maybe phylogenetic species concept is of our choice. Uh, I mean, we we should decide which concept to choose and we should stick to it. Um, so for the Saccharomyces genus, uh, I can see that it makes sense right now to use the phylogenetic species concept because we can gain all the information, uh, genomic information, very quickly with this new generation sequencing, and we can uh, draw trees and, and understand uh, um, understand the sort of relationship, uh, DNA relation, very quickly. Also, we know that the primarily a uh, uh, barrier to to um, to reproduction is given by sequence divergence. Um, so that also would, would make sense uh, 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 to stick with that concept. And then thirdly, Saccharomyces, uh, the Saccharomyces genus does not outcross very often, so does not do meiosis very often. So, I mean, using the spherogenesis species concept might make sense to me, but we need to stick back on, on, on what we, we choose. Having said that, uh, you know, going back on, on the case of Saccharomyces cariocanus, that is definitely 
and biological species, because if you cross it with paradoxus, you would not get um, viable spore. And that majority, and that is because it's got several uh, structural variation, uh, 11 inversion, five translocations, that is enough to take down the entire spore viability. So, but sequence divergence wise is, is, is a South American paradoxus. And if we decided that with what is counts, we just need to stick to that for our classification. Well, uh, I guess uh, I guess there's not a great history of uh, taxonomists agreeing to stick to to the same thing. Uh, but but uh, uh, yeah, thanks, Daniela. Uh, there's a question here for Tony. Um, it, it says that in your review uh, that, that that you talked about there, um, you, you you mentioned that the mechanism and rates determining patterns of loss of heterozygosity in the hybrids are rather poorly characterized. And the question is, what is a good measure of LOH? I mean, in hybrids, uh, because they are highly heterozygous, uh, then, I mean, depending on the divergence, no, if, the, if the two parental lineages are 10% divergence, so there is an expectation, you know, having, you know, 10 SNPs every 100 SNPs, you know, and that's, you can plot this uh, along the genome, and when you have an event of loss of heterozygosity, you see clearly a drop in this in these levels of heterozygosity. Mm -hmm. So this is the this is what I what I call uh, loss of heterozygosity in the hybrids, which is you know is loss of this heterozygous position. Uh, it's it's true that they are they are hard um, to define, no? Because yeah, if you have regions where you don't have SNPs, no? you have ninety expectation of 90 positions without any heterozygous position. So you know really when this uh, LOH boundary is. But within, uh, even if we take rough uh, approximations to this you know, LOH, we can see different patterns in different hybrids. And still, we don't know. I, I look at these candida uh, orthopsilosis uh, hybrids, and I see a lot of LOH blocks, but I don't know whether they represent, you know, how much time of evolution does this represent? And for SNPs, uh, you know, we have some idea of how many SNPs may accumulate for whatever number of generations. And we don't know this basically for the hybrids. Yeah. Actually, I, I had a question that just thinking about the LOH that struck me in, in, the two, in the two kind of case studies you showed at the very end. In a way, I thought that they were maybe leading to slightly contradictory conclusions, not questioning the data, of course, but but for, from, the, from looking at the transcriptomes, it looked like you know, there was no negative impact of hybridization. Whereas I guess loss of heterozygosity would, especially if it's the same regions which are lost multiple times, would suggest that there is a negative impact on that part, uh, on that part of the genome. Yes, well, actually this is because I didn't talk about what our results were in the second part, but I can, I can tell you that what we see is actually that there is not a very strong pattern of selection in the in the in the patterns of LOS. So we see there is a higher overlap than expected by chance, but we don't see, for instance, functional enrichment or enrichment, you know, for proteins that interact with the mitochondria, things like that. We don't see. We think there is a lot of drift going on in this in this uh, in these hybrids, which uh, also in this case of this. These candida hybrids, we don't see a bias towards one of the two parentals. We see that they have more, roughly 50% of each of the two parentals. So it seems that they have been coexisting and they don't have much of a problem coexisting for a long time. And they accumulate LOH, but maybe not uh, because they have to survive, because there is few regions that are, uh, you know, always LOH or always uh, heterocytes. Okay, thanks, Tony. Um... I, I, I've been taken to tax task by, by a well-known taxonomist for bashing taxonomists, so I won't do that anymore, Andre. Um, I'm going to go to another question here for Daniela. This is a question for Daniela about creating the allotetraploids. It is, doesn't the deletion of the mat locus make the yeast behave as mat A? And how were the yeast mated once the mat locus was deleted? Okay, so so what you do, you got two diploid strain 
that we made, the, we hybridized two species and we made a diploid, and then we hybridized two different strains belonging to two, these two different species, and we make another diploid. So we deleted the MAT A on, on the first diploid, and we deleted the MAT alpha on, on the other diploid. Now, these two diploids perceive themselves as being haploid, and then we, we, we then can cross them. So we have a MAT alpha deleted in one diploid, and a MAT A locus deleted in the other, cross them, and, and we have a tetraploid in, in, in that way. I hope that's clear. Okay, great, thank you. Um, you. You know, some of the questions that people have asked are very long and detailed, but mm -hmm. but we we will actually re we will actually record all of these questions, and uh, I can pass them to the speakers afterwards, and um, they, they they might be able to answer them separately. Um, so, so there's another question for Tony here. That's a short question, so I can I can ask it. Uh, Tony, it says uh, the fact that candida species have asexual reproduction. Uh, sorry, does the fact that candida species have asexual reproduction and their transcriptional mechanisms are so conserved explain uh, why hybrids keep or change their transcriptional architecture? Yeah, well, the, the, the transcription experiment was not done on a candida, was the, what I showed was for Saccharomyces. We, saw, we did the same for candida hybrids, and, and actually the results are very similar. But I think it's nothing, not specific for the candida uh, to have the transcription conserved. And also, despite the fact that they are described as asexual, we don't really know. And from the genomes, there is there is evidence that uh, that they can exchange genomic material. So somehow they find a way to uh, mate sometimes. Probably we don't know where where or when they do this, and probably they do this so rarely that we consider them as fully asexual. But from the genomes, you see that they can they can exchange material. Um, thanks, Tony. I, um... There's a question here, it says for both, so e either of you can answer this maybe, but it says if hybrids are unable to reproduce and propagate, why do they occur naturally? Well, the hybrid, they do propagate asexually. So, uh, I mean, we can keep a, a line of hybrid uh, propagating by mitosis. Um, that's how Pastorianus is, is, is carried. Pastorianus, which is the larger yeast, does not pollinate, so does not undertake meiosis at all. So yeast got almost the best of the two worlds uh, here. Um, but uh, if um, if we go, I'm thinking on, on a more uh, sort of uh, sort of evolutionary sort of um, you know in, in, in a world where you know an organism is only able to reproduce sexually. A hybrid is a dead end. So a mule, which is a cross between a horse and a donkey, is a hugely wasteful from an evolutionary point of view. I mean, if, if you think you have um, all this uh, energy put into a, 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 a mate, the, the mule, uh, the donkey and, and the horse, and then you have to make sure that the, the, the zygote uh, 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 is actually formed, and then the, actually the zygote develops, and, and then when it develops, it's, it's actually uh, alive, which is the mule. So, and then the mule is dead. It can go nowhere. So for species which are only sexually reproducting, it, hybridization is um, very wasteful. And that's why for a lot of species, of these species, there are um, some uh, reinforcement of the, uh, of the um, uh, uh, what we call you know pre-mating barrier so you, you're trying not even to make them mate because it's going to be completely wasteful um but in the case of uh, um hormones like, like yeast they can reproduce also uh, um asexually then if the hybrids can reproduce asexually it can go on i mean it will be problematic if uh, there are adverse conditions and he has to uh, make his tetrad because then the spores won't be viable. So if in that case, is 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 certainly um, um, disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, and actually, Tony, I was struck as well. I mean, you you mentioned that, uh, example in in wine yeasts. I mean, there's there's a ton of examples of introgressions, and and so and and you said that these probably all originated as hybrids. So so that would, um, I guess that would. I don't know. I'm speculating now. Maybe you can correct me, but that would indicate a, a maybe a biological function for hybrids as well, wouldn't it? Because I mean, it, it's it's a way of genetic exchange. Yes, I actually, I mean, it's difficult to say, but I do think it's a, it's a, it's a shortcut for evolution in a way, no? because you, you, you bring one trait or one gene or one allele that is, you know, was uh, developed by adaptation in another species, bring in into another species and you mix two, this is way faster than expecting, you know, that trait to evolve independently again. And I actually do think that many of the huge adaptations we see in nature, and I'm not only now talking about uh, microorganisms, I think this also happens for, for many other organisms, they relate to hybridization. Now we see this with the with genome sequencing, you know, even in humans, you know, uh, with Denisovans, uh, with Neardentals, there is, you know, there is an ancient hybridization and, you know, all Europeans, all Asians, you know, we derive from this hybrid in origin that we had, uh, you know, genes from, from the two populations and then some remain. So, uh, and now people is seeing that these, you know, alleles that have come from the Ardentas or the Nisovans, they are related to, you know, uh, resistance to some disease or adap adaptations and so on. So I think it's a, it's a shortcut for adaptation. And I think nature uses it often, at least more than we, at least I was expecting in the beginning. Now we are seeing this. In nature. Yeah. yeah. That, 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 yeah, that, that's a very interesting way of thinking about it. Um, I, I had a question, and someone has asked something similar here, Daniela, for you. It's, a, it's on a different topic now. It's, it's coming back to your isolation of a, a Saccharomyces a urei. Um, is, is it, I mean, you, 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 you described particularly fortuitous circumstances when you were afraid to go canyoning, and, and hence you... I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> it's you identified a new yeast, but you know you only had two hundred isolates, and it, may, it makes one wonder. I mean, are are there many other species out there, or or, or maybe conversely, is it surprising that no one else has identified Saccharomyces uri in in other habitats? Okay, so uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, I mean, I was uh, uh, thinking exactly the same when we were thinking how is possible that. You know, I mean, relatively inexperienced in this field, uh, uh, go there, bits, take bits of soil uh, and find a new species. I mean, we, we, we were quite uh, um, gobsmacked. I think there is more stuff out there to be found. Uh, I think that our met isolation method is, 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 is skewing somehow towards the isolation of all, always the very same species, like the um, paradoxus from the wild. And uh, I mean now, I mean when some pio pioneered the, the protocol at low temperature, we 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 managed to get the Cudriacelia, the much more uvarum, the Caio tolerant species. And uh, um, uh, it has to say, I mean, one of the ideas that I also developed in the review together with Haya was trying to understand how much is in there, just simply looking at the eDNA signature and sort of metagenomic type studies. And uh, um, people who've been trying before, they found a really little uh, of, uh, of this Saccharomyces uh, genus that can actually be seen, if seen at all. I mean, I remember a study of Duncan Gregg, he looked at the metagenomics and, you know, a lot of us didn't say this, but very little paradoxes, in spite of the fact that when he goes on isolation, paradoxes is there quite a lot. So Haya developed a technique in which we actually uh, enrich for the ITS-1 of this genus, uh, which is specific, uh, band size, 850 base per, and all the other fungal are, are actually much lower. So by enriching that, we were able to see a little bit more of the community that there is uh, that around. And we did see a metagenomic signature of Nikari in Europe. We had a few reads about Omnio Bayanus in, a, in two different samples. We had uh, several Yuri, uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, we, we saw pretty much everything except for Arboricola. Um, 
And uh, I also, uh, I mean, I think I'm okay to say that. I mean, the, the work has been by archive now. Uh, the group of Brian Gibson has found another strain of Saccharomyces urei in, in, in Germany. And, uh, and I believe he's also uh, uh, made some uh, beautiful beer with it. So, I mean, clearly there is, um, there is now, you know, more stuff coming out from, from these biodiversity studies. Okay, great, thanks. Um... We, we, we've come to the 90 minutes that, that I said that we, we would stick to. It. So I'm sorry that I didn't get to everybody's question. There was, there was actually quite a few questions that I didn't get to. But, but as I said, uh, we, we will collate the questions and we can pass them on to, to Daniela and Tony. Uh, you'll also find Daniela and Tony's contact details um, on the internet uh, easily enough if, if, you, if you want to contact them yourself uh, to, to ask any further questions. I'm sure they'll answer you as best they can. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity to to thank all the people who attended. First of all, we had, I don't know, we had 260 or 270 people. We still have over 200, I think, um, in, in attendance. So thank you very much for logging on and listening. Uh, I didn't say it, but there were quite a few uh, very nice comments for Daniela and Tony um, in the questions to thank you for the talks, uh, both of you. And the, the people, I think, really appreciated it. And I really appreciated the talks. I thought it was really interesting. Um, I've really enjoyed the discussion and um, I'd love to chat longer because I think it's really interesting um, and it's very clearly an exciting topic with a lot of really new things happening uh, led by your groups and I know by other people in, in the community as well. So I think we can kind of watch this space for more exciting developments. So, so with that, um, I will just say again, thank you to everybody. I say thank you to um, to FEMS and OUP people behind the scenes for for doing the logistics and organising it, Sarah and, and uh, Joseph and and uh, other people. And um, remember to send FEMS yeast research your best yeast papers. We're very happy to to take them, and um, keep an eye on the journal for uh, forthcoming special issues and interesting articles. And we have some other. Um, new things in the pipeline for 2021. Uh, you can see us on the website, follow us on Twitter, uh, etc. Okay, so with that, um, we will finish. I don't know I don't know how we actually end this, or I keep talking till everyone is gone. <laughs> but uh, so Sarah, I'd say you, you, can, uh, you can terminate us uh, at, at any point now. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>